Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, today, uh, we are very happy to have Lasse Pedersen uh, as our speaker in the monthly search and matching in macro and finance seminar. So as you know, our seminar is a uh, monthly seminar series happening in, at the second Monday of every month. And today uh, it coincided with this strange uh, time change period. There may be some uh, asynchronous thing between US and Europe. So uh, let's say he's going to present the paper game on uh, social networks and markets. And just to remind you uh, the rules. So we have a, a 60 minute seminar uh, followed by a 15 minute Q&A. And during the seminar, uh, only panelists uh, will be able to ask questions. And uh, attendees can type their questions in the Q&A space, but their questions are going to be answered after the seminar in the uh, 15 minute Q&A uh, time slot. And you can see uh, the list of panelists for our seminar today. And in addition to this list, uh, some board members and organizers and some of our regular uh, panelists are, are present as well. And our next seminar uh, is gonna be next month, April 11th, and Piero Gotardi uh, is gonna be the speaker. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn the screen over uh, to, to Lasse. Lasse, thanks a lot for, for accepting our invitation. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to speak at this uh, webinar. Let me uh, share my screen. Hope uh, you can see it. And uh, yeah, so feel free to just to jump in with questions anytime. I, I probably won't have time to look at the chat, but uh, definitely welcome any comments and questions. So the paper was actually motivated by the events uh, of GameStop that happened uh, uh, more than a year ago now. But I think uh, there are some more general uh, issues at play here. I think social networks have probably influenced equity trading since the very beginning of equity trading in the 17th century. For instance, De La Vega, he talks about how trading clubs were connected to Amsterdam Stock Exchange right from the very beginning and then how social interactions uh, affected that trading. And in fact, the London Stock Exchange started operating from coffee houses. And it was in coffee houses that things like the South Sea bubble played out. And standards talk about the, the coffee house internet where people were like chatting in these coffee houses and, and that affected uh, their, their, their trading decisions. So now I think social networks are becoming perhaps larger because of social media, and they're definitely becoming more observable to researchers. So I think we're starting to realize that this may be important for, for markets as well. And so the goal of this paper is to have as simple as possible a, of a model in which people trade based on what they learn from their social network. So there's a lot of a big finance literature on learning from price and, and things like that. Here, people are not gonna learn from the price, they're gonna learn from the taxi driver or from their friends on Twitter or Reddit and so forth. And I'll try to uh, apply that to GameStop and, and beyond that. And again, the, the model is very simple as I hopefully will, will show you in a second. And, and because it's so simple, uh, everything is solved in closed form, beliefs, prices, and portfolios. In terms of beliefs, what we see is some clear network spillover effect. And, and we see over time a convergence of all beliefs to a mix of what I call rational beliefs and fanatic views. And, and I'll be very precise about what these fanatic views, but these are basically agents who are stubborn, not about the rational opinion, but about something else. And then what comes out of the math is very clearly is that some people will be thought leaders and others will be quote unquote influences. And again, I'll be precise about that and show that both of these types of agents will, will matter for asset prices. And so prices will have these social network effects, including bubbles, excess volatility, price momentum, and fundamental momentum. So if price momentum is the idea, if the price has been recently trending up, it's more likely than not to continue to trend up. And if there has been good news, then that good news can be incorporated in price only slowly. And at the same time, there's long run reversal. So these are actually the main puzzles in asset pricing that the model can potentially help explain. Another big puzzle in asset pricing is that we 
my thing from theory that everybody should hold the same portfolio, but indeed in, in the real world, people hold very different portfolios and we see bursts of high trading volume and high volatility, uh, just like we see in the model. So the model can help uh, perhaps say something about GameStop, but also perhaps the anatomy of all the historical bubbles that Kindleberger and Slifer talk about, and also uh, financial markets more broadly in terms of all these anomalies here. So in terms of the related literature, to be totally honest, uh, I'm not an expert on network theory. I basically wrote the paper uh, based on being very inspired by the whole GameStop event and, and Marcus Brunemeyer invited me to his webinar to talk about it. So I started looking at the empirics first and then I kind of remember this paper by DiMasso, by Ernest and Swiebel, a very beautiful paper I read, I think in grad school. Uh, and, uh, and then I sort of just went off from that. And then of course, when I wrote the introduction, I had to read some more papers, but, and there's certainly a big literature on networks, but to my understanding, there isn't a finance model of, of networks. So that's sort of my contribution here. And also to have these rational agents in the group model in, in a very simple way is part of my contribution as far as I can tell. There is a, also a big literature on information percolation in terms of search and matching where um, uh, Duffy, Malamud, and, and um, so Simeon is here and, and he's both. Uh, I have made an early contribution, but the difference here is that uh, I have a social network effect. There are also other theories of, of momentum and reversal and excess volatility. But what's different here, and I think it's testably different, is that in my model, these my things model are coming from network, network dynamics. Oh, go ahead. Was that a question? Oh, okay. And in terms of the empirical finance literature, there are some very uh, cool papers by Theresa Kukla and Johannes Strobel at NYU and co-authors where they use Facebook data and they actually very convincingly already shown empirically that these kinds of network effects are empirically relevant uh, as well as a number of other papers that, that are cited in the, in, in the paper. So without going more into the literature, let me show you the model try to show you how to solve it and, and all the results. And again, uh, trying to convince you it's a very simple model and then show you how that model uh, might be applied to think about GameStop and GameStop just being one example, in fact, trying to touch on how it might affect, uh, how help you think about all the bubbles out there. So let me start with the model. So there is a single stock. The model can actually easily be uh, extended to having many stocks, but uh, I have just here a single stock that trades in discrete time. There's an exogenous supply of share given by S. And then there's a, an exogenous payoff to this uh, stock, which is, uh, has two elements, V and U. And the U is an observable random walk with a constant variance sigma U squared. That is that the increments of U uh, so U is a, is a random walk, it's completely standard, people see it, and it just creates some backwind uh, noise that, that people can be risk averse about. And then at the same time, there's this V, which is unobserved at each time T, but at each time T, it can be become revealed with probability pi, and it can be uh, remain unknown with probability one minus pi. So in other words, this revelation time here has a geometric distribution. And, and people disagree about this value. So again, we can think of in the, in the GameStop case, as you know, GameStop is, is a retailer that sells games in, in physical stores around the world. Yeah, my son used to go to GameStop in Denmark to buy games, but now that store is actually closed because you know people are buying their games online. So this physical store business is not doing very well, but some people believe that, oh, GameStop, they can start an online business. And there's a lot of disagreement about whether they can be successful in that online business. So we can think of UT as being this observable uh, value of the real estate that, that nobody disagrees about, that they have some re real estate there. And then this idea that maybe they can pivot online, people can disagree about it. And, and so you, you know, if you can think about what kind of stocks will this model be relevant for, it stocks where this things that people can disagree about is a big part of the total value. Um, 
And there's a, a recent empirical paper that sort of supports that, that kind of idea. The price of the asset then is before this revelation time, there's some endogenous price PT. So in some sense, the goal of this paper is to find PT. And then after the revelation, the value is V plus UT. So we can think of this revelation as GameStop goes bankrupt, for instance, or GameStop uh, is taken over by uh, another firm, or you know, it becomes clear that they were successful or not successful in, in this online business. But it, you know, there's a revelation of that V part. So that, that's the model. And we're looking for this P. There are N investors. Each investor at time zero re receives a signal, which I call VI. So the ith investor starts with this valuation VI. And investors have an interest in learning from one another. And the way I model that is that the true value is a weighted average of all these signals. You know, it's actually, so here they, they can actually collectively learn the true V. We can also just say that they collectively can find some conditional expectation and there's some residual uncertainty. It doesn't matter. It's slightly notationally simpler this way, but it, it really doesn't matter. But Let's say? What, yes. Just one question, um, clarifying question. Do, do you need, why do you need the, the liquidation date to be random? Do you need it for, to get like fixed constant price coefficients or do you need it for the results? No, I just need it to, to make everything simple and clean. Okay. But uh, it could be generalized uh, probably in different ways. But also, I mean, in real life, we don't know when these things end. Yeah, so I think it's kind of realistic. There are four types of agents, and I'll explain on the next slide exactly what, what, how they work, but one type is naive, boundedly rational, and what uh, Demas O'Dell called persuasion bias. So, uh, some are fanatic, some are rational short-term investors, and some are rational long-term investors. I'll, I'll explain all of these uh, in a second. But let me start with these naive guys and, uh, and just explain a recap what the standard the group model looks like. So any naive agent XI has a view as a time T, which depend on uh, all agents views at the time earlier, weighted by some adjacency matrix, or in other words, Mr. I's row in that adjacency matrix. So let me illustrate it with, with this example here. So the first agent, he uh, puts 70% weight in this example on his own view last period. So I think what I thought last period probably has some relevance, but he also puts, let's say, 20% weight on agent four and 10% weight on agent five. And then he updates his view like this. And what the Marshall and I'll show is that uh, in the first round of updating, this could be a rational thing for a Bayesian learner to do if subject to the constraint that he cannot listen to these people. So in the real life, you could think there's a million uh, people out there in, and a lot of agents will only listen to let's say uh, a few hundred maybe at most and so there's a lot of zeros and, and if you just don't have the technology to listen to the other people could be rational but the, the, what's slightly irrational here is that they keep using the same updating and they don't take into account that it could be the same information that cycles through the system uh, we can see that every row here has to add up to one but it's not true that every column adds up to one. So we can see, for instance, if a lot of people listen to this first agent, he becomes uh, what looks like an influencer. And, and that's uh, what we'll come back to later. Um, this agent four here puts 100% weight on his own prior views. Uh, so that's a, this is what I call a fanatic, somebody who puts 100% weight on their own view and zero on every, uh, everybody else. And then agent five here, I will assume in this example is a rational person. So what should a rational person do? A rational person should listen to everybody. That's a rational thing to do. And, and then in the first round, list, you, know, you wanna listen to everybody and form the correct conditional expectation. Um, and then the correct way to do that in this model is just to weight everybody by these kappas, their relative importance. And so let's say in this example that everybody has an equally important signal, then the, the agent will uh, put equal weight on all the signals, doesn't put any special weight on, 
on his own signal. He's just saying, no, no, my signal is no better than everybody else. But then after time two, uh, he now knows the truth. So at that point, he becomes completely stubborn. He just puts all the weight on his, on his own signal. And, and this makes the model very tractable. The fact that if, if you thought about, if you are a rational person who can only listen to a small fraction, then in the first around you maybe learn what a hundred people uh, have learned out of you know thousands and then in the next round you hear maybe from the same people but you, that you know that they've heard from other people and so on you could eventually get there but in finite time time in fact you will know everything uh, regardless but i just it, it, but it becomes extremely untractable uh, the problem so the the whole the group like as far as i can tell just ignores the, the rational people, assume they, they're not part of the model. But in finance, we always want the rational arbitrageur. So what I do here is, is a, this little trick that makes everything super simple. I say, I allow them to have the technology to listen to everybody in the first round. And then once they've, they've done that, they, they become stubborn in the sense that if somebody says, no, I think it's worth 500, and they keep saying that every, every round, I think it's 500, it's 500, the rational person will say, well, I listened to you in the first round, I, your 500 valuation was part of my uh, overall valuation, but I don't further update. You don't have to keep telling me that. I have now the, 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 the correct valuation. So last thing. Last thing. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so first question is without loss of generality, you could have just given them the information at zero because after one round, they know it. So for the long run, from round two on, so that's what. The other question is, you say they're n types, but they're what many clones of each type. There's no strategic behavior here. I'm just trying to understand what the assumptions are. So um, the people are strategic in their trading, but not in their communication here. And we can come back to how you might uh, generalize it to strategic communication. But here the idea is that you know you're talking to your friends honestly. I know it's it's a crazy notion for a finance professor that people would talk honestly to their friends. Yeah. But uh, if you think about, you know, how you teach your MBAs at Duke, you probably teach them, well, you should have a little investment club and your investment club, you should try to predict out future cash flows and, and, and then project them back. And you should learn from your friends by being honest about them and talking to them in your investment club and trade on it. And that sort of people are kind of doing uh, what you teach your MBAs to do in this model, but they are maybe not doing what uh, Grossman Stiglitz tell them to do. Let's say I have a question sort of related to your discussion and the vicious question. So here you implicitly assume uh, for the rational person, uh, it's more like a complete network. So everyone is a hidden friend, so they can observe all the information directly. So we should assume you give, give this person the full information and then uh, starting from there. So I'm just wondering whether if you allow them to learn information from some aggregate variable, either volume or price, so whether that's kind of equivalent to what we should suggest maybe it's a similar, you can also observe the information perfectly. Yeah, it is similar. And by the way, it is true in my model that at time one, they, they've learned everything. So we could just start it in like, at time one, it wouldn't change the math. Uh, um, but um, but still, we still have all the other the group people who are naive and, and, and who haven't figured stuff out. But um, how you get to time one is not going to be important from everything else I'll tell you. But somehow the rational people figured out a, a way to be rational. In my model is by listening, but you can take it in another way. And then the question is what happened from here on? So then the question is how do they trade? Because that's essentially the, the, what's new in, in, in this case is embedding this degree model in the model of, of trading. So, um, and the standard degree model is just all about how it beliefs evolve, but 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 here people are actually acting on those beliefs. So again, the, the supply of shares is as exciting as S, and then in equilibrium that has to add up to the sum of all the, the demands for shares. And what I assume here is that people solve this this problem here where they they maximize the expected uh, uh, return or expected profit at the revelation time. So remember at the revelation time, you get this V plus U uh, of the revelation time. And, and so here X is playing the role of V because this is my view, the H and I's view of what X is. 
And then uh, there's a variance of that profit. And, um, and then there is a risk aversion, which is I'm calling basically one over the risk aversion. I'm calling that W. So W I think of as the wealth divided by the absolute risk aversion. So this way of writing it allows me to sort of think about the effects of, of wealthy or less wealthy uh, agents. Last thing, there is no price effect in this. So this is a competitive model. That's what. So the price is right here. And so I'm. But, but in a strategic model, you would account for the fact that in a Kyle type model, my quantity, the price depends on the quantity and there's a market maker or a demand curve or something. None of that occurs here. So you're, well, you're taking well, it does. Everybody, everybody you can think of it submits a demand curve. So this is the demand of agent I. It's uh, basically the, fun, the fundamental value as viewed from that agent over and above the price. So this is basically, this is positive. The agent thinks, okay, this is a good thing to buy and they will buy more if the fundamental value is more above the price, if they are more wealthy, if they think revelation will happen earlier, or if the risk is lower. So you can think of everybody has this demand schedule, which is a demand that depends on the price. And then these demands, again, we have to find the price that make these demand add up to, to the, so it's definitely an equilibrium model. Uh, for the rational, so I have these rational long-term investors here. They actually really know this. Uh, their X really is the, the value, the true value V. So what they're doing is, is fully rational here, except for the fact that they are taking this long-term perspective. They're thinking about it from now until time T, or time tau. Uh, in terms of the, the naive agents, their valuations are not the true V. So I'm assuming that they are also naive in the sense that they behave as if their current uh, valuation is the, the true one. The most sophisticated investors in the model, like to these, what I call rational short-term investors, they are not thinking in terms of the, the price change from now until revelation. They're thinking about the price change from today until tomorrow, regardless of what happens tomorrow. So they're saying tomorrow, today the price is P, tomorrow, uh, you know, there, there are two possibilities. It could be that there's no revelation that happens with probably one minus pi, in which case we are still in this a network situation where people are speculating the price is endogenous. And, and in this case, I expect to get this much. There's also a probability pi that there's a revelation, in which case the price will become the value with my current rational valuation, which is the same as, as V, and then the, the, the price tomorrow actually will, will have this UT plus one in it. But since U is, is, a, is a random walk, the expected value of U is T plus one is UT. So the, the demand from the short-term rational investor it has this linear form. So Lars, if, if you just had the long-term rational investors and short-term rational investors, do you have a unique price path or unique equilibrium then? Yeah, Without fanatics case, and stuff like that? Yes, we'll see that I'll, uh, in a second. When I get to the equilibrium price, I'll have a rational component and, and what I call a network component. The rational uh, price is the, is the unique price under transversality condition if everybody's rational. So the, the price, uh, the rational price is uh, what I call the rational price is V plus UT minus a, a risk premium. And let's say, you know what the demand would be if uh, you had uh, intertemporal rational investors? I mean, you know, investor who do not solve either conditional revelation or just conditional on supplying everything in elastically next period, but who optimize over the entire horizon. Yeah, I mean, these guys are doing something that could be viewed as, as a long-term rational, um, but in the sense that they have, they are, if they make more money, let's say they don't change their risk aversion. That's the only sense in, uh, in which they're not fully rational, but they are not doing, there's not a, a, a sort of the dynamic but, mistake these guys are making, but it's just this constant absolute risk aversion over time assumption that, that comes through here. 
just to make things very simple. So the, the short-term rational guys are very, very rational. And in particular, uh, we'll see that they, to compute this expectation here, uh, they have to understand the whole network structure. So to understand what will the price be tomorrow if there's no revelation, I have to understand that Pierre is going to be talking to Ben, who's going to be talking to Vish, and, and, and the price is going to be affected by what they are telling each other. And in fact, the rational uh, short-term investors can fully predict because he knows what everybody thinks now and he knows who's talking to whom. So he can actually fully predict how the price will evolve inside the network uh, as long as there's no revelation. Uh, just a clarification. Um, so to do that, the rational investor has to know the entire matrix A from the previous slide, right? The weights yes. that each yes. rational, any rational and fanatic agents put on like previous expectations. And they also have to know all everyone's expectations, right? Yes. Okay. So this is a strong assumption. I totally agree. But I think it's sort of an interesting benchmark yeah, to see what's gonna happen, but it's certainly a very strong assumption. And everything is set up to make things super clean and easy. Uh, Lassie, did you, did you get a chance to check their wealth dynamics to see the, whether the influencers will make more money or the rational person will make more profits, whether somebody will, will, will survive or somebody will vanish in the long run? Yeah, so the, the, the rational short-term investors should make the most money in expectation. Yeah. Uh, just one more clarification. So the matrix A, you don't have a micro foundation for that, right? It's taken as... Exo it's exogenous yeah, at the moment. Definitely, okay. yeah. Got it. Yeah. And that, I mean, there are many a very interesting extensions, I think, uh, and, and that would certainly be one of them. Uh, but let me show you how to solve the model. First, let me just uh, preview my results with, with just uh, uh, some of uh, one of the key results from the literature, from the group paper and the, the, the Marshall paper. So, what these guys uh, show is that they, uh, believes if everybody, so here everybody's not even connected. And so these papers, uh, you know, point out that, that the views at time two will be A times the view at time one, which is A squared times the initial views. And at time three, it becomes A cubed. And at time T, it becomes A to the T. And, and so those papers are essentially about what happens to this matrix A when, when T goes to infinity. And the beautiful result is that uh, it converges to this matrix where every row is the same. And the row is the list left eigenvector, let's call it Z. And so we can see that everybody reaches a consensus and the consensus is this weighted average of people's initial views. And the, the weights here are not the, the weights that are the true importance of everybody's signals. It's the weights depend on the A matrix. So, if I'm a very influential, I have many people who listen to me and those people are themselves influential, then I will get a, my signal will get a big weight. Okay, so that's sort of the key result in literature. And um, it's interesting in my case, actually, to say, what, well, what if the, just one of them was rational? Because normally, again, all of them in the literature are, are, are these persuasion guys, naive people. I said, what if just one of them is rational? In that case, it becomes like a Marco chain with absorbing state. Then it actually also converges to a consensus where everybody ends up agreeing with the rational person. So that seems like, oh, that's great. We can get maybe rationality in the long run. It's actually sort of, you can lay it to this paper by Golub and Jackson, where they say all opinions in a large society converge to the truth if and only if the influence of the most influential agent vanishes. So again, if everybody's naive, you have to have the most influential being not very influential, but in the, you know, Elon Musk, he has more than 50 million followers. And Kim Kardashian has more than uh, 200 million, I think. So we know that condition is violated empirically, but, but maybe we say, oh, that's okay, because the, the rational people are stubborn and, and they kind of keep repeating the same thing and that's gonna eventually persuade everybody. Unfortunately, there's nothing in this argument that relies on the rational people being rational. You could also have just one, fanatic age and everybody else being naive, then everybody will end up agreeing with the fanatic. So if one person says, 
there were more people at Trump's inauguration than every other inauguration. And then people say, no, look, here's a photo of Obama's inauguration. Here's a photo of Trump's. Clearly, there are more people at Obama's inauguration. No, but somebody just keeps saying, no, there are more at Trump's. There are more at Trump's. Then if people will, are willing to listen, everybody will believe that in the end, in, in this type of model. Now, my model is one in which, no, there's actually not just, there could be many rational people, there could be many fanatics, and I, the collection of fanatics and rational, I call them hard-headed or stubborn agents. And so they are in their, in their adjacent matrix for these guys is the identity. And then we have the other guys, the naive people who listen to one another with this A and and then they listen to the hard-headed people with A and H. And then the question is, what do, does the, the, this A matrix converge to now? And let's just do this example. So we had this example before. We can take A squared. Then these numbers change a little bit in different ways. We can take A to the 10th power. It becomes this. These numbers become smaller. We take A to the 100th power. We can see all these numbers become effectively zero. So what, what then happens is that all the views in the long run are determined by the views of the fanatic and the rational. So in other words, these guys stay the same and the first agent puts two third weight on the fanatic, one third on the rational. And this turns out to be a general result that all the naive views can be written in this closed form way that depends on their beginning point and the fanatic views or the hard headed views, I mean, but over time they will be fully determined by a convex combination of the hard-headed views. I was, uh, I was wondering if I could kind of ask a conceptual question about the role of rationality. Sure. Um, like if you had fanatics who had like stubbornly different views, would that lead to similar, a similar equilibrium? Because essentially you, you have like your rational people become stubborn and right. the fanatics are stubborn in kind of a, a sort of a bullish direction. Correct. Uh, could sort of replace, could you replace the, the, the rational person with someone who's stubbornly bearish? Yeah, so the rational, you could see from the belief dynamics, there's no difference between being rational and being stubborn. And that's why I, I joined them in this group of hard-headed agents. And those agents, uh, mathematically, there's no difference. There is a difference when it comes to the trading, because I assume that only some of the rational are these very smart short-term people who can understand the network dynamics. But in terms of the belief dynamics, there's no difference. We can also look at a numerical example. So here, uh, I assume that the rational people uh, figure out that the true valuation is 300. The fanatics think the valuation is 500 and then naive agents, depending on who they listen to more, they end up somewhere between 300 and 500. So there is convergence, but there's no consensus. So the whole um, uh, the group literature is mainly about what is the consensus and here there is no consensus. But of course, in finance, what we care mostly about is the average view. The average view is what determines the price. So we can still talk about what Master, is the average view. That this result is only because my learning matrix is fixed. If that were to oscillate in some way, it, it, it this could change. It's because you fix the who I who I listen to in some sense. Yeah, you're saying if there is variation as who I listen to, if the A matrix was random, there could be uh, fluctuations. Yes, that's that's uh, certainly. Uh, an interesting uh, extension that uh, one I've actually talked with uh, Simeon about. To, to build on that a little bit, I mean, you use GameStop, I guess, as a leading example in the application. But I guess one of the you know defining features of that is everybody loved it until they all hated it. Um, but it seems like this is built for convergence, not not these sort of swings over time. So is that something you're, you're thinking about when you want to talk about those applications? or? So actually, uh, first of all, I've simulated a bunch of different versions of this. You can have a lot of crazy swings before you get uh, convergence. Oh, I see. Even with people kind of with the one period, like deciding what they've known and staying. Oh, you yeah. Could you could you still... have this okay. whole powers of A. You can have lots of wild things happening. 
Okay, okay. Uh, but also, as I'll show you the, you know, the picture of that comes out of even the simplest version where there, things are very smooth in my graph. It kind of looks like GameStop. I mean, GameStop, you would say people stop loving it, but the price is still very high. Yeah, no, I was looking more at like the, what you have on the screen here seemed to, uh, but I'll, I should wait. I should wait. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me, before I get to the price, uh, again, in finance, we often care about the, the average opinion, which by the way, I think is, is interesting beyond the finance application. So, in, but in finance, we care about the wealth weighted average. So here, what I call X bar is the average across age and weighted by their, what I call wealth. So it's really one over their risk aversion uh, times the, the opinion, or we can choose the, the vector of wealth times the, or, or the opinions divided by W dot. This W dot is the total wealth or the to sum of one over risk aversion. Um, and what I call thought leadership, this is uh, my definition, is that we know that the average view is going to convert to a weighted average of all the initial views. Those weights, well, that is my definition of thought leadership. So if you have a big, if your opinion is a big part of the final overall average valuation, then you are a thought leader. And then I also define only for the naive agents, right, their influence of values, which is uh, related to, which is basically, you can think of it as this infinite sum of this adjacency matrix among the naive, which, which also can be written like this. So it's basically how much you influence other people by talking to them directly, but also how much uh, uh, do I influence, let's say, Vish by talking to Pierre, who then talks to Vish. So that's basically A squared. A cubed is how much I influence Vish by talking to Pierre, who talks to uh, Simon, who then talks to Vish. And, and A fourth is how much do I influence Vish through four steps, okay? And so I call that the echo matrix. Anyway. What turns out to be the case is that if I'm naive, then I have zero thought leadership. In other words, if, I, if I'm not stopping, if I keep listening to other people, my own initial uh, opinion will wash out. People will, yeah, will sort of forget about it. Everybody will forget about it because we, we keep hearing other things. And, and what we in particular keep hearing are these stubborn views. So the only people who are true thought leaders are those who never change opinion. So if you think about in real life, like let's say in religion, you know, Christianity, they don't update the Bible, right? They're completely, the Bible stays. And that's paid, you know, part of the thought leadership of, of a religion or, you know, this scientific method, it, the method stays. So science is another sort of thought leading view of the world. And, it, and the thought leadership can be written in this way. So this, this part is sort of a boring part. It just says, I'm gonna convince myself if I'm stubborn and I have some small fraction of the well. So this part is not so interesting, but this is the interesting part, which is, um, you know, this is basically the column, my column in this adjacency matrix. So how many people are listening to me? How much are they listening? And weighted by the influence of values of these people. So even if, if, if um, in the GameStop example, there is this guy called uh, Deep Fucking Value who, who was very influential. He had many people following him, but then when he got Elon Musk to also follow him effectively, you know, then he became really a thought leader because Elon Musk, while he might not be very interested in GameStop per se, he's, you know, has lots of followers. So when he starts uh, paying attention to this guy, then he becomes very uh, thought leading. And these naive agents, while they don't matter in terms, they have no thought leadership per se, they can affect who is a thought leader. So this is saying that if a naive agent who himself is not a thought leader, if he follows a thought leader more uh, by epsilon, so he changes this adjacency method by following some thought leader more by epsilon, then that uh, thought leader will have an increase in the in her thought leadership uh, that um, increases by the influence of value of the naive agent. So the naive agent are sort of the derivatives here. So um, if we go back uh, here, for instance, we can see that initially agent one, you know, put 
dot twice the weight on the fanatic versus the rational. So it's not surprising that in the end, when these views are completely dominating uh, agent one view, that it's two third, one third. But uh, agent uh, two and three, they actually put 10% on each. So they were equally influenced uh, by the fanatic and rational, but they also listened to agent one. And agent one was again, very uh, affected by the fanatic. So the fact that eight and one uh, is affected by the fanatic makes these two other guys end up being very influenced by the fanatic. And, and so um, uh, that, that's basically where, where this comes from. I also have another example here. I'm not sure I have time to go through it, uh, but very briefly again, in this example here, the fanatic has a thought leadership of, call it 57.8%, which again means that the consensus, or the, the not the consensus, but the average view uh, ends up have being 57.8% times the fanatic view and the rest times the rational. So again, you know, 57.8 can be thought of as this average here. He convinces himself, not the rational. And we saw this from the previous slide. But we can also compute it as uh, how much different people listen to this agent. So that's this part of this matrix multiplied by their influence of values. Plus, again, he himself is, is convinced. And so if, if one agent, let's say the first agent listens to this person 21% rather than 20%, so one percentage point increase, then the, the thought leadership will increase by 1.56%, again, because that gets multiplied by the influence of value. So these influence of values here, you can see that the first agent here has a big column, so therefore the first agent has a bigger influence of value, and these guys have smaller influence of values. Okay, so that's all about the beliefs, but then we also want to think about prices. So here, when we again equalize supply and demand, uh, these demands depend on the endogenous price and we can solve for the price. We get this equation here that the price essentially is a weighted average of all the agents views, plus this random walk component less, essentially a risk premium, and then plus something related to the price next period. And then this C is a, is a constant that is less than one. Then we can iterate this forward to infinity with a transversality condition. And, and then we can get prices that can look like this. We can also get uh, more uh, crazy price patterns, but well, this is sort of a typical case where the price, uh, there's sort of a bubble that, that evolves slowly and, and then uh, it, it collapses uh, when uh, there's a revelation, for instance. And so, so they- uh, Let's say, let's say. Yes. Uh, on the graph, if you were to draw the average beliefs or some version of average beliefs next to the price, what would you get? Uh, I'm just trying to to understand the importance of, I mean, second moment, say, or you know, like in the short in the in the bubble with heterogeneous belief literature, that matters a lot for the the emergence of bubble. Uh, the, the second is, moment is the path of price that we the, see on this slide, just a function of average belief, or it's also a function of belief being very dispersed from say time zero to time 50? No, they're very closely related to average beliefs, but not uh, so um, the, the short-term invest, uh, investor is doing something that some, somehow is, is maybe surprising is that the short-term investor could be at this point, for instance, here, mm -hmm. when uh, the price is above, like here in this example, the, the, the fair, fair value is around 300. Okay, so you might think, uh, you know, that everybody should be shorting at this time, but actually the short-term investor is saying there's so much momentum up that is, if there's no revelation, the bubble is gonna keep growing at such a pace that it's better to go long uh, the asset, even though it's all value. It's a last thing. And so for that reason, uh, let, me, let me just finish, uh, answer Pierre's question. For that reason, the price is not a one-to-one -one with the average opinion. If everybody was a long-term investor, 
it would be, but but when these short term investors are there, it's a little more complicated. Yeah, so I have two different one two questions. One is it's a bubble because you made the fanatic up. If I flipped it, it could, could go to the, the other way completely. Yeah. The 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 other issue is this idea that the short term guys ride the bubble, that's kind of there in a blue and Bruno Meyer this old JFE paper where at some point in time, the news is going to come, uh, but there, there's a lack of common knowledge as to when that occurs. So, so even though you know, this, you know the information, you know it's going to break, you just, you say, but in the short run, there's this big momentum. Uh, I'm going to play the momentum instead of, seems to be very similar intuition to me. Definitely the similar intuition. What's different here again is that we have these people who are, basing their momentum view explicitly on understanding this uh, this network um, structure and, and the network chat. And we have real world traders who are actually now following some of these chat rooms and so on. But let me just show the actually what the price looks like and then we can talk more about it. So the price has these two components, a rational component and a network component. The rational price, which would which is the equilibrium when everybody is rational, whether they're short-term or long-term rational, is the rational valuation of this V, so XR is basically the same as V, plus this random walk component minus a, a risk premium, which is increasing in the supply and increasing in the risk uh, in the normal way. And in the network uh, component of the price uh, has these components, it's basically, what is the valuation of the naive and this is the average valuation of the naive investors uh, over and above the rational valuation. And this is the average valuation of fanatic agents over and above the rational valuations. And so this is um, this is the relative wealth of these fanatics, and this is the relative wealth of the naive agents. But uh, what is the sum doing? The sum is saying, what matters is not just the naive misvaluation, if you want to call it this, today, but also what will their misvaluation be tomorrow, the next day, the next day, and so on. So also to come back to Pierre's question, if we didn't have this sum, then the price would sort of be one-to-one -one with the average view. But the fact that, that we have these forward-looking rational agents in there means that, that future you know, if everybody knows that the, that people will come to their senses tomorrow, prices will quickly correct. But if we think that people will stay confused for a long time, prices will also stay uh, wrong for a long time. And uh, as time goes to infinity, then this network component uh, com converges to the misvaluation of the different fanatics. Here, I'm sub summing over the fanatics and then the relative uh, thought leadership of the different fanatics. And uh, as a result, we, we immediately see that this long-term price, if, if we have a fanatic that uh, has a stronger valuation that increases the valuation X, that will move the price one, not one-to-one, -one, but basically their thought leadership to one. So if they have a thought leadership of 0.2, then if they increase their valuation by a dollar, the price will move by 20 cents. Yeah. The influencers that we discussed earlier uh, don't have any, uh, the naive agents don't have any thought leadership, but they can be influencers. So if Elon Musk, for instance, will increase his following by a, uh, by a fanatic, by epsilon, then the price will increase by the, how much this fanatic overvalues the asset multiplied by the influencer value of Elon Musk. And when Elon Musk started tweeting about this, the price did in fact increase in, in the real world. We can also look at returns. So if you think about expected returns, expected returns can be viewed as the probability that there is uh, no revelation, in which case we get uh, that this network uh, component of the price uh, will, will, uh, will change in this way. And if there is a revelation, then we get the difference between the current price and the true uh, expected uh, fundamental value. Uh, so we can think of this as sort of 
this network momentum here is not exactly the same as price momentum. It's how much the if there is no revelation, how much will the price stay change in the next time period? It turns out that this is actually quite close to how much the price changed last period, which is basically the change in the network component, less this brown in noise. So what happens uh, in, in this model uh, is that there tends to be what finance people call value and momentum effects. And, um, and that also affects therefore how these short-term rational traders uh, position themselves. So here we have time on the x-axis and the position of the short-term rational agent on the y-axis. What we see is that they have a very big long position here because the security is undervalued and it's trending upward. And um, then they continue to have a long position even here, as I discussed earlier, because you know, that this momentum effect is more important than the value effect. Then eventually when the price gets up here, then these guys are saying, look, if the price is no longer trending up in a very meaningful way, maybe in a, in a small way, uh, but what's more important is that if there's a revelation, I will lose a lot of money as the price will jump all the way down here. And so this value effect uh, becomes more important and then they start shorting. So uh, that's what I show here is that, that value and momentum strategies are profitable in, in this uh, model. It's actually not the most profitable strategy. The even more profitable strategy is to compute this network uh, momentum and, and compute the value and then trade on those. But if you are an, an econometrician, you don't have access to this kind of information, then just simple price momentum and value would also work. And that these short-term investors uh, trade in this way of, of initially buying a rising undervalued asset, which is what you would call value and momentum. Then they trade on, val on momentum, but against value, and eventually they trade on value, but against momentum. And then under, under other parametric assumptions, everything goes the other way. And so can I, is it fair to say that in the world value is arise because I care about revelation and momentum because I care about the, that there's no revelation and the price continue trending up. It, it comes almost directly from the form of the objective of the short-term investor. Or? It's not that I care about it, it's not that my profits are affected by those two possibilities or those two possible okay. outcomes. So that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you're right. right. So uh, the, the possibility of a revelation will always make me sort of a value investor. The possibility of a momentum or, or no revelation will not always, but nearly always sort of be something like a, because in some sense, this network component tends to be a relatively smooth function of, of time. So it's sort of, it's not, the price is not differential because I have this random walk component, but if you take that out, then you're left with something that is basically tends to be almost differential. And then uh, you have uh, in the model also a spike in, in, in volume that, that dies down and the spike in volatility that dies down. And those will tend to die down faster than the price. And that's actually sort of an interesting thing to, to look at when we come to GameStop. So let me just also spend a few minutes talking about GameStop. So actually the whole paper started with Markus Brunemeyer. He asked me uh, to, 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 to talk in his webinar about this uh, situation. And then I looked at the, the data at that time, the price has, has had this huge spike and, and actually Paul Krugman uh, had started tweeting that my, uh, my old paper with Markus Brunemeyer on predatory trading could help explain this, this spike because in this case, actually, it was the small investors who are the predators and, and the, the hedge shorting hedge funds were the victims. So obviously, Marcus and I were very proud that Krugman uh, tweeted about this. And, and so Marcus asked me to, to talk about this. And when I talked about it, uh, I realized, well, there's also all these social media uh, dynamics going on. So that's why I kind of wrote this paper. Now, arguably, our old paper can help explain this part in the fact that it collapsed. And if it had just stayed low here, maybe you could say that's it. It was this sort of short squeeze of predatory trading. But the fact that it then went back up and it stayed up and only now more recently is coming down 
I would argue that has nothing to do with the short squeeze of predatory trading. It's something altogether different. And I think that's what, what this, this new paper is about. So, so this is sort of what I'm interested in here. So what's going on here? Again, we saw that the price you know, has stayed very high. Actually, the volatility was extremely high, but it has come down to normal levels by now. Turnover was extremely high, but has come down to normal levels. So it's sort of interesting that volume and volatility have come down to normal levels, even though the price has stayed elevated. In my model, that happens because the, when the views converge to different levels, but to some level, then it, there's nothing really to trade about once we have convergence because trading is when people change their minds. It's not about having difference of opinions. That means we once and for all, I go long, you go short. But once we converge, then volatility and internal dies down. Yeah, but prices stay elevated because we have these hugely optimistic people still out there. And so that's what we've seen. Uh, and so I would say the way I would sort of link my model to, to this evidence to say, we have this investment idea that's expressed via social network, just like in Proposition 1, maybe this idea that, that GameStop can pivot online. Then we have these fanatic ideas that gain prominence over time. And interestingly, in, in this community, they seem to understand that, that there's something important about being stubborn. They have this meme called diamond hands that basically means you should buy and never sell. You should be very stubborn. And in my model, that's captured through this types of investors and the adjacency matrix who are very stubborn and, and worrying. Obviously, they could be having a a weight on their own view that's close to one doesn't have to be exactly one uh, but but that is, is close to this meme of diamond hands in the real world these social networks affect the price as they did in the real world and this fanatic view creates a bubble and again the fact that that more extreme views create a bigger bubble seems to be consistent with the with the this uh uh YOLO or, or rocket meme. So the rocket meme is basically you should push the price to extremes by, by having these extreme views or having this uh, you only live once trade. And uh, the price increased when an influencer follows these fanatics. So when Elon Musk had this tweet uh, game stunk with a link to the Wall Street bets, we basically have this situation where Many people uh, listen to Elon Musk. So this adjacency matrix has many non-true elements when, when it comes to Elon Musk. And when Elon Musk then follows Wall Street bets, you know, then uh, Wall Street bets become more influential, becomes uh, more thought leading, and therefore the price moves as it did in the real world. We had sophisticated momentum and value investors reported in the news, just like in, in this proposition. And we had a spike in trading volume and volatility that died down faster than the bubble, uh, just like we had in that last proposition. And if we think about bubbles uh, more uh, generally in historical cases, what, what Kindleberg and Schleifer say is that the bubbles start with an initial displacement, which in my model uh, occurs when these investors receive news and fanatics focus on one element that, that and we have these uh, differences of opinions. Then the next element is speculation, which happens in my model that the, all these agents trade and in particular these short-term investors bet on these network spillover effect. Then it, it, they say there is a mania and emulation, which in my model happens as these opinions spread via the network. So in, in here we can, every time we multiply by this A matrix, then, then we explicitly modeling this emulation step-by-step step, how the ideas are spreading through the economy. Then uh, they say there is an authoritative blessing when some authority says this is a real thing. And you know, in, in the model, that's like an influencer that follows a fanatic like Elon Musk in the, in the GameStop case. And <clears throat> then we have that insiders sell out, just like the rational investors in my model, they, they bet on a reversal eventually. And then Kindleberger says that crash can happen as a revelation or a revulsion. So a revelation, I've talked a lot about this revelation time, it is exactly what Kindleberger talked about, or a revulsion. So a revulsion can actually be modeled in my model. If these fanatic people don't listen 100% to their own previous view, let's say they listen 99%, then eventually they, they start to figure out the, the rational view, and then you can get a price path that, that looks 
like this, what I have it here where it goes down rather than it goes, crashes down, it goes down slowly as the rational view sort of creeps in in this revulsion. So, so the model can also capture that. And as I mentioned, it seems to be that there's starting to be a bit of a revulsion about GameStop, um, but also in asset pricing very generally, you know, we have these announcement effects, post earnings announcement drift, we have momentum, fundamental momentum, we have local biases and networks below effect uh, with this Facebook data. We have a big literature on excess volatility, on value investing, and long run reversal. So, you know, I'm not saying the model explains everything in finance, but maybe uh, some of it. So, with that, I think I'm right on time. Can I, uh, let's say I have a question. So, since you're talking about this GameStop, um, Sorry. So I think they're in your model, they're trying to learn the fundamental values, right? But but it sounds like from the story, they're trying to learn how many naive retail traders there are to keep this momentum going. Like it's like everyone knows the fundamental value shouldn't be that high, but as long as there are more retail traders coming, we can keep this going, right? So is it is it the same thing? These two kind of learning, I think. Probably that not right. So can you explain that? Yeah, that's a good question. So you're absolutely right. In the model, they're actually trying to learn the fundamental value. And uh, if you listen to so Keith Gill was the most famous of these uh, fanatic investors, if you will. He actually witnessed to Congress, and and you know when he, he gave his witness, he will he talked about you know he believes it's a good company that it has he has put on online you know why he think fundamentally it's a strong company and so there are certainly a number of investors who will uh, talk about the fundamental value same thing tesla has a very st high stock price and, and you'll hear people talking about why tesla is amazing an amazing company and they have all this data for people driving same thing with the cryptocurrencies you know many people think cryptocurrencies is a bubble but every finance department I've ever been to has like one faculty member who says, no, no, it's actually a real thing and it's uh, going to take over the world and it has this fundamental value. So I would argue there are, in all of these cases, people who are making the fundamental case, but you're absolutely right. Then there are also people that, that are sort of more just betting on the, the greater fool in, in a sense. And in my model, that's to some extent captured by these rational agents. But there could also in the real world be like another a group who are maybe emulating the fanatics for some not fully rational reason. The last thing, <clears throat> the stories you're telling are all about bubbles. I kind of kind of pushed this a little previously, but the model is completely symmetric. Uh, why are they not fanatics in the real world saying this thing is worth, crypto is worth zero? Uh, the question I'm trying to ask is, why are all the stories in one direction? The model doesn't say anything about that. No, you're right. The model uh, doesn't could go either way, and maybe there are uh, the opposite of value. I mean, so, so people call sometimes call that deep value, and uh, I have an empirical paper called deep value. So I mean, uh, there could be uh, undervalued securities out there for similar reasons. Of course, uh, you know there are people who have an incentive to make positive bubbles more likely. So for instance, the firm. Uh, if if uh, all these investors are confused on the upside, the firm has an incentive to just stand back and issue some share, but not uh, explain themselves too much and just say, oh, yeah, that sounds like yeah, you guys are onto something here. Let's start to, to do what you guys are talking about. But if the, firm, if the market is very confused in, in the negative direction, obviously the, the, the firm has an incentive to, to try to explain and, and away that confusion. But it certainly could be that it goes and sometimes goes in the other direction. But, um, I mean, relatedly, I mean, you gave a, an answer about the asset supply, but that's, uh, I mean, it could be just a problem with a particular model of asset demand you chose. No? So for bubble, you need, uh, you, you need the optimist to have more elastic demand than the pessimist. And, you know, traditionally people do that with, then the pessimist has, and then, uh, then the supply is pessimist and traditionally that's done with uh, with short sale constraints. Yeah, so, yeah, I know. That's also another important thing that that there could be short sale constraints. Uh, but um, 
And now a lot of retail traders are also trading individual equity options. Yeah, so they could buy puts and things like that. But given the richness of the model, you could give sufficient conditions on the mark, the network structure. So presumably the adjacency matrix and uh, the market size for price behavior to be consistent with what happened after GameStop, right? Um, there should be some sparsity, minimal sparsity yeah. condition and something. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I haven't thought about that, but uh, that would be cool. Uh, it's an interesting idea, definitely. I mean, likewise, you could give sufficient conditions for these effects to be absent. It would be interesting too. Yeah. yeah um, of course, uh, a simple one is everybody's rational, but uh, or right okay. yeah but um yeah but it would be interesting to know uh yeah, yeah more testable i you know how could you get more testable implication out of this and and how could you take it to the data more directly um and also i mean in some sense in my model there's news only once then there's this random walk that that creates some noise that makes people risk averse but in but in terms of what people disagree about, there's only this one, you know, shark in the beginning. But in in the real life, there could also be you know news coming out. So my model is almost like an impulse response of this one disagreement shark. Uh, but it would be interesting to to keep having new sources of disagreement. Hey, we are officially in the uh, Q and A session now, and we have ten more minutes. So if there is any question from the attendees, please raise your hand using the raise hand function of Zoom and we will uh, let you to speak and ask your question. And any further question from the panelists, you can uh, chime in and ask your questions. Let me let me mention briefly that uh, I think Vish asked earlier about what about you know, strategic behavior you know, what if, uh, couldn't I have an incentive? So in my model, everybody is saying the truth and then people listen to one another, these true sources of information. I do I personally think a lot of market behavior involves people are being honest with their friends and so on. But there could also be, uh, you know, people times where people have an incentive to, to be less than fully transparent. So in my model, it could be captured a little bit in the back door, for instance, you could have a person who, suppose I, I want to split myself in two, so I have uh, one part of myself is a short-term rational investor with all my money. And then another part of myself, I have no money, but, um, but is a fanatic investor who, who, who claims to believe all the time that the value is, is 500. In that case, the, the, the part of myself with no uh, money will, will basically make a pump scheme, a pump up the price. And the, the, the rational part of myself that has all the money will trade on this and, and, and basically initially buy and then dump it. So that's basically what's called a pump and dump. So you could have a pump and dump in the model if you allow one investor to, to play these two parts at the same time. Um, what this example also shows is that the part of me that has no money could have a big effect on the price. So normally in finance, we think an agent is important proportional to his wealth or her wealth. But in this model, you could be hugely important without any money if you have many people who follow you on social media. So what is an important agent actually has two elements. You could be important directly via, via your own wealth, but you can also be important via your effect on others via social media. Lasse, can I ask you a question? Ricardo, sorry. Yeah. definitely. Um, so I mean, just from reading the news, it, it looked like uh, some of these uh, GameStop investors, I mean, they had something clear in their payoffs. They wanted to hurt somebody short. They wanted to squeeze the big guys. So, I mean, how is this something that uh, you, you capture with something that you have here? Or you see, in some sense, they will not be completely stubborn. You know, once they squeeze them out, then they go back to doing their business or, you know, they, they were no so dogmatic yeah, yeah. in terms of having a fixed valuation. They just wanted to hurt somebody and then, yeah, that's what I mean, that in some sense, that's this part here that we saw in, in January uh, 2021, which my paper is not really about. That's my old paper in a way. 
And if it had just gone to back to $20 at that time, you know, I think that would have been the end of the story. But then here, so I found all the interest on this, uh, all the data on the short interest and so on. So here, actually, the short interest went way down. There were no more people to squeeze. The, this story died down in the news. And, and so that story was a very important story for this. But for all what's happened since this, for in more than a year, it's not been a story, as far as I can tell, and it has not been in the data either. Okay. Uh, quick question here. Uh, you mentioned the model implication for asset pricing in terms of momentum, reversal, value. And I was wondering, do you have anything to say also about the volatility anomalies that have been discussed in the literature? The volatility you're saying? Like high volatility being followed by low return. I'm, I'm trying to think if there's any uh, link yeah. to your model there. Yeah, I mean, so the... Um... Yeah, so the model also, it, again, some of this is not fully general, but the model has this uh, high vol tends to have uh, that they, 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 and it's actually the reason I'm hesitating a little bit depends on conditional volatility, how you define it, because in some sense that if the, this bubble part is kind of smooth until it crashes, uh, then um, the random walk component has its constant volatility, but the valuation ratio, um, you know, goes way off, and and so the whole price level there is way more than it should. Uh, and you in the model, if you have agents coming a little bit in and out of the market, so that not everybody was present at the same time, you would see that the price could be hugely volatile in the beginning when the, when the, the bubble is forming. And, and so that would be then followed by a, a low return later on. So I think it would be potentially consistent with it, but I don't have a full general result on that. Okay, there is a question uh, in the written Q&A. Uh, it refers to some slides before the game stop. Uh, the question is, why does the position of the short-term investor uh, not change after the crash when the truth is revealed? Oh yeah, that's uh, it should go up here. That's, that's a fair point. Yeah, um, or it could go to depend. Yeah, either just the asset disappear, or at that time everybody holds uh, sort of one or their wealth that they share the risk at that point. So yeah, that that's. Uh, the, this is drawn as if there is never a revelation. So that's a good point. Okay, it looks like there is no more question from the attendees and if there is no more question from panelists either, then uh, this is officially the end of our seminar. And thanks a lot for uh, joining uh, everyone. And let's say thanks a lot for the uh, great seminar. And our next seminar is going to be uh, in, in one month on uh, April 11th. Uh, thanks again for all your questions and comments. And feel free to email me if you have more uh, suggestions or comments. Thank you, Lassie. Well, thank you.